sensory overload. How primate neuroscience reveals the mechanisms of our perception. Stefan Treuer, German Primate Center, Leibniz Institute for Primate Research. On the 9th of November 1989, I was at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I remember that a fellow student told me the news, but I didn't believe it, thinking that the student misunderstood something. I didn't realize that the wall had really come down until I turned on the TV news that night. As we all know, life is a challenge. From the perspective of evolution, it's all about survival and maybe reproduction. Luckily, evolution has endowed us with maybe not a defective diamond, but the most complex organ that we know as of today, the brain, to help us in this task of facing this challenge. So what do we have to do? We have to pick up information from our environment to decide how to act on it. This is not all that different from an artist who takes a picture and renders the environment on a canvas. Now, more technically speaking, our nervous system is at the interface between the environment that provides the surroundings and provides the information and choosing amongst many possible actions the one that's most appropriate for survival or maybe reproduction in a given situation. Now, how do we achieve this? What do we have to do? What we need are sensors, powerful sensors that pick up the information from the environment and convert that information into what we call a representation, an internal picture of our environment. And based on that internal representation, we can decide how to act. To really be good at this, we need powerful sensors. You can imagine, you can have a huge nervous system with all the powers that you can think of, but without appropriate information about the environment, it's of no use for us in terms of survival. Let's look at an example of a particularly powerful sensory system in action. I brought you a little um, video clip here from a, from a, a real-life situation of survival. If you look at this red fox here in an American national park, it has to produce and reproduce and has to pick up information. There doesn't seem to be all that much. But survival is at stake. He's very hungry. Where is food? Watch his ears carefully. Something is going on. <laughs> and if you look very carefully at his snout, you see that lunch was captured, and he survived another day. Thanks to enormously powerful ears that were able to hear the little rodent under many layers of snow. Now, we don't usually run around like this looking for, for mice, <laughs> but we have very powerful sensory systems ourselves. Let me switch to the visual system from this example from Audition, and let's talk about us. So what's behind our ability to see very well is, of course, not only very sophisticated sensors, but an equally sophisticated nervous system that can process the information that comes in from the sensors. Because vision doesn't end with the eyes. It's the information transfer into the brain. So here you see a side view of a human cortex. And these arrows sort of indicate how information flows through our brains because the, the visual information enters in the back of the head and is then distributed across a number of areas that make up our visual cortex. And if you think that vision is just one of the many tasks we do, it's just one of the senses and there are many other things that we can do, you might be really surprised to realize that one-third of our cortex is devoted to vision. One-third of our processing capacity for a single sense. It tells you how important seeing is for us. Now, the brain is much more structured than you can see here. And if we look at the visual system with a little more detail, and I don't want you to memorize this picture, but I want you to get the story that information that comes here in the back of the head is then passed through a series of areas to generate something that we call perception. And the one wall that's breaking down over the last decade or so that I want to tell you about is the interpretation 
that vision is mostly about a stream of information from an incoming area through a series of steps as a one directional kind of information processing. And let's, let's keep that thought in mind. These areas are very powerful. How do they achieve their ability to support vision? If we want to know what's happening on a cellular level, not just on the scale of the whole brain, we need to measure the activity of individual nerve cells in a living brain that's interacting, that's picking up visual information. So we could do this in humans, but it's rare and it's only under special circumstances. Instead, we're looking at the rhesus macaque monkey, a very similar system to ours, except he's actually devoted half of his cortex to vision, but that's just the better for us. So what we want to do is record electrical activity from individual cells in the, in the neocortex. And just to give you an idea of the scale here, this is a human hair, and this is a microelectrode that needs to be brought close to an individual neuron in a, in a way that doesn't hurt the animal, or doesn't inflict pain on the animal, which works because our brain doesn't actually have any pain receptors. That's why it could also be done under special circumstances in humans. And now we can go in there and train an animal to do a visual task, to sit in front of a computer screen and essentially do a video game. Tell us by pressing a lever, and that lever is connected to a computer, if the animal sees something to react to things on the screen. I can tell you about these tasks within minutes. We have the problem that most of our monkeys don't speak English or German, so we need to train them. And the training takes months sometimes. And during the training, the monkey learns to solve a particular task with the visual information that's presented on a computer screen. And once the animal is trained, we can record the activity of single neurons in the brain and see how the activity of the single neuron represents the information that's presented in front of the animal on the screen. So we can sort of watch the brain encoding the information. The monkey is rewarded whenever he's doing the task right with something to drink. You hear the clicking of the valve. Here's a view over his shoulder onto the computer screen. And with time, you can build up quite complicated tasks where they have to respond to events on the computer screen. As I said, when the training is over, we can then start recording the electrical activity. And you have to know, you hear it in the back there, this crackling sound are individual pulses, what are called action potentials of individual nerve cells. They fire these action potentials to communicate. And with a microelectrode, we can pick them up in response to a particular visual stimulus. There's a lot of amplification and computer power necessary to do this, but then you can see or you can hear the brain in action on the level of an individual neuron. Let me show this little example of a, of a neuron that we've been recording from. Before I started, I need to explain to you what's happening. You're looking at a copy of the computer screen in front of the monkey. This sort of circle is the window that every neuron has into the world. Every neuron just sees a little chunk of the reality around it and picks up information based on the stimulus that's presented within that receptive field. So if I start moving these now, you hear the pulses. Every one of them is one action potential from a neuron. And you can plot the activity as a function of the direction inside the receptive field. And what you will see is that this particular neuron cares about motion to the left. It's a filter for the direction of motion. It encodes moving stimuli and signals to us or the brain in general what direction of motion is present in the environment. Now, you have to imagine that there are millions of these neurons all tuned to different directions, and as a concert across all these neurons, they encode the visual information. This is the flow from the eye up into higher centers of the brain that I talked to you about at the beginning. It's a very powerful machinery and gives us high resolution in terms of our perceptual ability. Now, imagining that you have these neurons not only for direction of motion, but for color, for the orientation of edges, for the depth in a visual scene, you can imagine that the visual system breaks down an image into its local properties, each of them handled by specialized nerve cells. It's extremely well understood how that works, but there is a problem. As powerful as this machinery is, it delivers too much information. It is more than we can handle in a given situation. Something is lost because our processing capacity is not sufficient to cover everything that our sensors pick up. 
Now that's a prediction I'm making to you. This is a claim, and it's a claim that we're usually not aware of. If you look at me, you don't have the impression that I'm incomplete because some parts of me you can't process. You don't have the impression that you know there are gaps in your visual perception. So that has to be studied a little more carefully than how we do this in this sort of introspection here. Let me show you a little movie from an American campus taken by colleagues who were investigating the visual ability of this person in the middle. Here's the experimenter. They're both interacting. His very powerful visual system picks up a lot of information about the scene, and now the experimenter creates a short diversion and changes the visual scene massively, trying to see. If the person on the right <laughs> notices anything, many of the subjects do not notice anything. Some of them get really concerned and run away. And if you ask them what happened, they say something strange happened, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> so, as powerful as our visual systems are. We choose to analyze only a small portion of the incoming information. This might be surprising to you, and you might not believe this, but the organizers of the meeting asked me to try this with you as the subjects. So even though you might not be white-haired and a lot younger than the guy here, you might not have noticed some of the things that have changed in the room while I was giving my presentation. Who noticed anything? I see very few hands. I turn to my colleagues here, who all volunteered for this experiment, and maybe you hold up what you changed. So all of them turned around their badges into these bright blue badges just about a minute ago, while your attention was directed elsewhere. But your eyes were clearly able to see this. Now this might be a little small from the people in the back, but for the people in the back, did you notice that we now have blue lights on the walls there? Maybe we can switch back to the correct illumination. We just switched. The color of the wall for you, and I hope and I think it's right. Most of you didn't notice that, so that shows you that we're very selective about our perception. In fact, the small amount of the information that we can process, we have to be very careful about because if it's irrelevant information, then you're wasting your processing powers on something that you don't really need for survival, and at the same time, you might be missing something critical. And this sophisticated cognitive process that underlies this is what we call attention. Now, how does this attentional system interact with the neurons I told you about? The neurons that pick up sort of the physical properties from the environment and simply encode the physical properties. Nothing about attention or meaning or importance in that processing. So let's go back to this little experiment. This is what you've seen so far. You've seen the data from this neuron or this receptive field, and how this neuron is tuned and responds to a certain direction of motion. If I let the experiment go on a little bit, and now instruct the animal, different from before, to instruct the animal to direct its attention on this stimulus, and I will code this in red when this happens. So now I'm changing the instructions. The animal is now attending to the stimulus. And as you can see in the red plot here, the neuron becomes much more responsive. It doesn't lose its selectivity; it still encodes the direction of motion. But the same physical stimulus has now become more powerful in terms of its signal that it passes on into the brain. And that's presumably what happens if we use attention to select information from our environment. It becomes much more prominent. So attention creates a representation of our environment that is not a one-to-one -one copy, but rather emphasizes the things that we care about and de-emphasizes others. And the basis for this are these neurons that I just introduced you to. So to sort of to visualize this effect, if we think of this as the physically correct representation of a given scene where people crossing these these crosswalks, if you now imagine that the neurons prefer motion, it will de-emphasize non-moving parts. That's sort of a sensory representation. And now you're focusing your attention maybe on these two people here in the middle. What that will do to your internal representation, it will enhance them and push down everybody. These people are moving to the left, so you're not only attending to the location, but also their direction, which will mean that the poor woman over here, who is at the wrong place and moving in the wrong direction, essentially becomes invisible to you because your <coughs> internal representation is missing that crucial piece of, uh, of uh, information. 
from the environment. So to summarize, we have a highly sophisticated system for picking up information, very powerful, but to handle this amount of data, we need an equally sophisticated selection system, the attentional system. What we then have is a problem if there are deficits in the system. And many of you have heard of attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder, a problem with processing ability on an everyday scale. <laughs> That's very attention capturing. <laughs> so perception is an active process. It's not a passive copy of our environment. Thank you very much. And therefore, if we go back to the picture at the beginning, while it's a very nice artistic rendition, it might not actually represent what we do. I'm much more like this picture, drawn by the same artist three years later, which I think captures the generative aspect of vision, seeing what will be there in the future. Thank you for your attention.